Are you digging up the dirt on your dead? Want to find out how? Hear the latest on new family history sources and websites with interesting and fun guests and experts. Find out what other people have been learning about their ancestors. From kings to thieves, inventors to farmers, nothing that's been discovered should surprise us anymore, but it always does. Find out what we mean. Great family history stories and information are on the way now with Extreme Genes, Family History Radio, and ExtremeGenes.com. Dates in the Bible don't quite match the marriage certificate. Uh oh. Greetings, genies across America, and welcome to Extreme Genes, America's family history show, and ExtremeGenes.com. Fisher here, your radio root sleuth on the program where we shake your family tree and watch the nuts fall out. Wow, what a response to last week's show and my visit with Shelly Smith. If you didn't catch it, I was able to assist Shelly in identifying both of her now-deceased birth parents. And the birth father was found through DNA testing using a technique called triangulation. Now, not everyone who researches their history will ever have the need or the opportunity to use triangulation. I'd never tried it prior to this case. And certainly not all of us have birth families to identify and locate. But you need to know that, as mentioned last week, DNA triangulation can also be used to identify ancestors for many generations back. Well, this week, I'll visit with a listener who has searched to extend one of her lines for many years, but through DNA and triangulation, she's been able to identify with reasonable certainty the parents of an ancestor born at the beginning of the 19th century. As we've often mentioned, DNA is a great tool, but even better when used with other sources. Such was the case with Shelley's birth parents' search, and such is the case with the story you will hear later on in the show. I'm appreciative to Tennessee's Jeannie Nicholson for agreeing to come on and share her story. And before we leave this topic for the moment, I need to mention two things. First, people are always asking about the experiences of others locating their birth families. As you know, not all experiences are positive, but I'm happy to report that Shelley Smith had a wonderful first meeting with her half-brother through her birth father last week. He had lost his two older siblings in the past decade and was thrilled to learn he has another sister. They're looking forward to learning a lot more about each other in the coming weeks and months. She's also had some very warm email exchanges with her half-sister from her mother's side and is learning a lot about her birth mother. They expect to meet sometime later this month. And while there has been some shock and surprise within the birth parents' families, they have been nothing but kind and welcoming to Shelley as she seeks to learn more about these important people she's wondered about her entire life. She took the chance, and in her case at least, it's been a delightful experience. The second thing is, if you're having trouble buttoning down whether someone is a half-sibling or a first cousin or a half-uncle, etc., through a DNA test, I will have some information on how you can get more specific with your DNA results in the next few weeks. So get ready. All right. I'm also excited to have on the show today the man behind a terrific tool called Pazilla. As described by our friends at FamilySearch.org, Pazilla allows you to get an aerial view of hundreds of descendants of your ancestors. It uses all kinds of symbols to display patterns of incomplete research. Tracking down descendants is obviously hugely important if you're assembling a one-name family history or just want to locate distant cousins who might have information on your common ancestors, say from the family Bible or family records, or who might even have rare photographs. Coming forward to move back is a technique I've used many times with great success over the years. I just wish I'd had Pazilla to help me out back when I needed it most. We'll chat with Bill Harton about his creation coming up in about six minutes. And Tom Perry, our preservation authority from TMCPlace.com, will be here to answer a listener question about why her photos and videos are suddenly blue. What's going on there, and how can it be fixed? Can this happen to you? Tom will explain it all later in the show. It is time once again for your family histoire news from the pages of ExtremeGenes.com. 
Well, there's been a lot of heavy rain resulting in a lot of flooding in southwestern Oklahoma. And as a result of that, human remains believed to be about a thousand years old have been discovered. Located in eastern Comanche County, authorities brought the remains to the University of Oklahoma, where archaeologists determined the body was likely that of a man about 40 years of age who was almost certainly an American Indian. A local tribe that wishes not to be identified took possession of the remains and buried them at an undisclosed site. You know, it's entirely possible that, like the famous Iceman discovered some years ago, that the man they buried is a direct ancestor to many of the natives who have long called that part of Oklahoma home. You know, it wasn't that long ago that King Richard III was finally laid to rest and presumably for the last time after being found under a British parking lot. And as we say in the business, this story had legs. I mean, it went on and on from identification to analysis of what he ate to how he died, the legal battles for where he would be buried again, you know, for the sake of tourism. But it all ended just a few short months ago. But then comes this. Another British king may also be resting under a parking lot in England. Yes, Henry I, the youngest son of William the Conqueror. Experts are now trying to determine if he might be under a parking lot in Reading, England. Henry I was king from 1100 to 1135 and has been called energetic, decisive, and an occasionally cruel ruler. The story goes that he died at age 35 from downing too many lampreys, which is a type of jawless fish. He was laid to rest in Reading Abbey, which was mostly destroyed in the 16th century. Well, the person who led the research for Richard III's body, Philippa Langley, is getting a team in place to use radar to mark exactly where the full abbey once stood and hopefully locate the remains of King Henry I. It's thought that he might be found beneath the school, a playground, or yes, another parking lot. Nonetheless, experts say the odds of finding and then identifying Henry I are very long. They note that he lived a full 350 years before Richard III, making genealogical evidence less reliable. And from a selfish viewpoint, I wish them all the luck in the world because stories about royals under parking lots are the tales that keep on giving. And that's your family history news for this week. Check out these and other stories at ExtremeGenes.com. And coming up next, it's the Godzilla of all descendant trackers, and it's called Pazilla. We'll talk to the man who created it, and we'll talk about what it can do for you and why it's important. Bill Harton, Pazilla's CEO, is up in three minutes on Extreme Genes, America's family history show, and ExtremeGenes.com. Genies, not long ago, something happened with one particular online research service that changed everything. It happened with a service that already has 75 million members worldwide, and it's not who you think it is. Hi, it's Fisher, and you know I'm always looking for new and better ways for you to discover your ancestors, not just the data, but the stories. The online service I'm talking about takes your family tree and then uses its powerful automated technology to match the people in your tree to over 5 billion records from a around the world. Censuses, newspaper stories, vital records with 97% accuracy. This means no more wading through thousands of useless so-called hints. This also means the site itself is constantly looking for matches for you even while you're sleeping. What site does all this? It's MyHeritage.com. You can try MyHeritage.com for free. Here's a special gift from me. Use discount code ExtremeGenes after signing up and get an exclusive 20% discount at MyHeritage.com. Did you know that Family Search Family Tree is available through a powerful new mobile app experience? That's right. Now you can view, edit, and even add information to ancestors in your family tree whenever and wherever you are. You no longer need to wait to get home or make a date with your computer to view or update your family tree. You can add details to your tree when visiting with family or when capturing details from a trip to the cemetery. You can share new family history discoveries from 
classroom settings. You can even make the most of your time when waiting for doctor appointments or car repairs. Get started today by downloading the free Family Search Family Tree app to your Apple or Android device. Visit familysearch.org/treeapp to get the Family Tree app for free. Exploring and expanding your family tree has never been more convenient. Visit familysearch.org/treeapp to download the Family Search Family Tree mobile app today. While we all love diving into the deep end of our gene pool, don't forget about capturing the histories of those who are still with us. Go to StoryWorth.com to start your family's story today. Each week, StoryWorth.com will email a question to people whose stories you wish to preserve. Questions like, tell us about the day you got engaged, or what do you remember about your grandmother? All they have to do is reply with a story, either by email or by telephone. That story is then forwarded to the family and securely stored in a private online storybook. It doesn't get any simpler. You can enroll up to six storytellers for, get this, just $49 a year. You'll get a free one-month trial. And for a limited time, Extreme Genes listeners get an additional 10% discount at StoryWorth.com slash Extreme Genes. That's StoryWorth.com slash Extreme Genes. Is your family story worth 13 cents a day? Sign up now at StoryWorth.com slash Extreme Genes. Simple, secure, effective. Your story is worth telling. And welcome back to America's Family History Show, Extreme Genes and ExtremeGenes.com. I am Fisher, your radio root sleuth. Uh, excited to have on the line with me today the creator, the CEO, the Grand Imperial Poobah of Pazilla. It's Bill Harton. Bill, welcome to the show. Nice to have you on. Happy to be here, Scott. Boy, you have created something that I just think is a most useful tool. Uh, how long has it been around now, and how did you come up with this? Well, we take the story back to when I was a kid. My mom, trying to do family history-related work, found that her aunts and grandparents, etc., themselves had done a lot of family history work, and the pedigree research had been done back to the point where records were very difficult. She was a beginner, didn't have the skills to improve on what they had done where the records were more difficult. So she started doing descendants research. She would take out a long long sheet of butcher paper, 12 feet or so, yardstick and a ruler, and a sharp pencil, and do a descendants chart. She took out an ad in a paper back in New York and Pennsylvania, small town where our research originates, and said in the paper, anybody with this last name, contact me. No other explanation. I suppose they thought they were going to get some money, but people contacted her. She would travel then back and meet with these people for about a month each year, take this descendants chart, share what she knew about cousins with them and ask them to do the same. And she'd come back with new information to update her chart. And she did this for all the years of her life. Wow. And uh, amassed thousands and thousands of cousins. Fast forward to 2013, in my local church group, we had the same problem. The pedigree work was done. And I was in my church responsibilities, responsible for encouraging people to do something, and they couldn't. So I knew there was work to be found along cousin descendant lines, and I knew how to write the code and interface with the family tree database. So Pazilla was born, and this was about August or so of 2013 that we first turned it on as an experiment, and it exploded from there. Wow. And where did you come up with the name Pazilla, by the way? Well, you, you always look for a catchy name, and it's hard to find a word that isn't taken. So it's really <laughs> a contraction of puzzle and gorilla. Ah. So uh, some people think it's pronounced puzilla, like poodle, but no, it's puzzle. And the puzzle idea is really at the heart of it. We consider the growing tree to be like a jigsaw puzzle. Absolutely. Parts that you've put together. Yes. And new evidence records are the puzzle pieces, and the task is to to find where they fit, plug them in, grow the puzzle, hence Pazilla. I like I like the idea of puzzle plus Godzilla because it's just the monster of, of all descendant technology. It's fantastic. Well, that's where the name came from, Pazilla. <laughs> and we couldn't get .com. It was taken, so the domain name is Pazilla.org. 
So, you know, I used to do exactly what your mother did, but not as early, I'm sure, because I had the same situation. I'd, I'd push my chart all the way back. I'd reach the end, and for almost a decade on my name line, I had the same problem. And my feeling was the same. Well, what happened to all the descendants of these people? And so I started to track them down, and you'd go through the wills, and then you would try to look through the census records and whose kids had what, and then go to the white pages, or you'd call 411 and see who was listed in the phone book at the time. And what I didn't expect to come from it, Bill, was that there were people out there that had a lot of information that wasn't available in books or in public records. They had family Bibles. They had old photographs. I found a man in Minnesota that had a portrait in pastel of my second great-grandfather done in 1875, and he said, this is your name line. You have to have it. And I said, you are absolutely right. And so finding descendants is a, a huge tool also in pushing lines back, in my opinion. It is. You get more information this way. And uh, a lot of people discover that descendants research is easier because as you move forward in time, the records only get better. Also, the multiplication factor is on average six children per family so you find six children together as opposed to finding two parents so you get more people to add to your tree moving forward tell me some of the stories that you've heard as a result of your software that you've created well we have a large number of people uh, the, the classic story large number of people who have tried for years and years and years working on a pedigree line and been unsuccessful trying to extend that quite often they'll get stuck on one particular person and spend an inordinate amount of time researching that person without realizing maybe they ought to turn their time to something more productive so when they see Pazilla and realize there's all these cousins waiting to have their children found, uh, they get real excited. One of my neighbors had tried even using Pazilla. He had tried going back six generations and then coming forward. He found a lot of that was done. Uh, and he was frustrated. He spent three or four days trying that approach. I uh, had the idea, this was back before we had the ability to adjust the number of generations, I suggested we try going back seven generations. I created a way to do that in Tanzilla. And uh, when he went back seven generations and came forward, he uh, found all kinds of new areas for new research. And this is a, uh, a very proud, brave man, but he had tears in his eyes because he tried so long to find a place to make the contribution. So that's a very typical story. Yes, I, I, I would imagine. Um, Pazella has the ability to show duplicates. They can show records with no sources or that have sources. Can show uh, where possible record hints are using the family tree hints uh, capabilities. And so when you bring a tree up in Pazella, you can look at these uh, aspects across hundreds of records, four to six, maybe 800 records at a time and see where quality may be strong in other places where quality may be weak. If there's no sources, for example, you can look at the hints and go in and quickly attach sources and just discover problem areas. All right. Now, I know there are people chomping at the bit wondering about where they can take advantage of Pazilla. And I think I failed to mention right from the start that uh, you guys have a great partnership with FamilySearch.org, as do we. And this is a great place because it's one tree and everybody contributes to this one tree. So Pazilla is perfectly positioned for FamilySearch.org to find all these descendants. Now, what else can Pazilla be used with? Right now, Pazilla is only attached to the family tree database. We have plans going forward to attach the other major databases, but those have not been implemented yet. Do you see a day where perhaps you could use it with uh, some kind of personal database, such as with Roots Magic or Ancestral Quest? Yes, I do. Our first foray in that direction will be with JEDCOM files. So Zilla will be able to take a JEDCOM file from any of these programs and upload it, in essence, into Zilla and then view it that way. So any JEDCOM compatible software would be able to be viewed through Zilla, both pedigree and descendants. Wow, that's exciting. And when will that be coming out, do you think? 
Well, I would anticipate it towards the uh, third or fourth quarter of this year. Okay, so if somebody goes on Family Search right now, FamilySearch.org, and they want to use Pazilla, what's the best way to go about that? They need to go into their browser, the URL address bar, and type Pazilla.org, two Z's, I-L-L-A dot org, and hit the sign in button. They will sign in using their family search user ID and password, but that will then position them in their tree in Pazilla. So you're looking at the family tree database, but through the lens or the microscope or telescope of Pazilla. Uh, a lot of people think of Pazilla as an aerial view. If you were yes. lost in a, if you were lost in a forest, uh, wouldn't it be great to be able to get up above and look down and see where the campground is, where the cliff is, where the road is? Pazilla gives you that kind of an aerial view so you can survey a large number of descendants. And uh, it puts on markers to indicate various properties like sources attached or hints or lack of sources, things like that. So, Bill, other than simply identifying the descendants, how else do we use the Pazilla tree? Well, the most important use people find is as you look at the descendants view, you will see children of a person who themselves have no children. Now, this is very unusual. Most people did have children. It's not that they were without children. It's mostly because the research by someone else who found them stopped at that point. What that means is it's a starting point where you can pick up where they left off and discover their children who are missing from the tree. The trick is to see what's not there. You need to see and understand with your imagination that there are children of these people who appear to be childless in the chart. It's simply because that's where the black top ends as far as current research and where you can start laying down new black dots. Boy, that's powerful stuff. Well, Bill, you're a genius. And on behalf of everybody out there searching for their ancestors and the ancestors' descendants, we thank you for what you've done and uh, look forward to the next step for Pazilla. Well, we all do. It's been quite a ride, quite an amazing response. All the response that we've gotten has happened by word of mouth, and uh, we really appreciate people talking about it. That's helped us a lot. Well, thanks for coming on the show. And coming up next, remember how last week we talked about triangulation with DNA tests to identify a birth mother and a birth father? Well, our next guest is going to tell you about how she used the same strategy of triangulation to identify an ancestor dating back to the 18th century. It's all coming up next on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show and ExtremeGenes.com. Scientific studies have proven that youth who know even a little bit about their family history perform better academically and have a greater sense of personal confidence and stability. Genealogy is its own incredible superpower that arms our children with super strength. But how do you get your child or grandchild interested in studying their family history? That kind of stuff is just for grandmas, right? Not anymore. ZapTheGrandmaGap.com leaps the generation gap in a single bound. Author Janet Havorka provides you with useful and timely advice on helping the young people in your life become engaged in their own family history. Janet has an entire collection of books to inspire the young and the young at heart in fun, interactive ways. She also offers creative tips and advice on her blog and in her free weekly newsletter. Stop by ZapTheGrandmaGap.com today to sign up for Janet's free email newsletter with 52 weeks of easy tips, free downloads, and order your set of resource books and workbooks. Can't figure out how to get your favorite Windows genealogy software running on your MacBook? Look no further than Crossover. Crossover by Codeweavers at www.codeweavers.com allows you to run your Windows software on your Mac without the need to buy a copy of Windows. Crossover is easy to install and simple to use. Crossover supports many popular genealogy packages like Roots Magic, Legacy Family Tree, Personal Ancestral File, Family Tree Builder, and more. Crossover also lets you run other popular productivity apps like Microsoft Office and a wide range of games. So if you're looking for an easy, affordable solution to your Windows compatibility needs, Visit www.codeweavers.com today to download your free trial of Crossover. 
And don't forget to use the deal code FAMILY for an additional 40% off when you purchase Crossover. Looking for an easy way to show off your family history and share it with your family? Family Chart Masters offers beautiful custom pedigree art pieces and inexpensive family reunion draft charts in any design or size that fits your needs. With a free consultation at FamilyChartMasters.com, you can get started creating a new family masterpiece. Family Chart Masters has over 11 years of experience in creating and printing family charts. They can print any style of genealogy chart from any genealogy file and can create exactly what you're looking for. You'll work with a specialized and talented consultant whose goal is to make you happy. Decorative charts make fantastic gifts for all occasions. And with Family Chart Master's option of ordering duplicate charts at half price along with your original purchase at full price, you can afford to give a family heirloom to each member of your family. Contact Family Chart Masters today at FamilyChartMasters.com for your free consultation. Family Chart Masters will give the greatest care to your family history. And welcome back to Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show. I am Fisher, your radio root sleuth. And uh, I am very excited today to be talking to Jean Nicholson. She's in Tennessee. Hi, Jean. Welcome to the show. Hello. And, uh, you know, you have gone through all the things that so many of us have done in our research, search for decades on end sometimes to find a, a connection to the ancestor you're looking for. You finally had your breakthrough, and that's what we like to hear about on the show is how people did that. We can kind of share your glory and also learn a little bit from what you've done So, Jeannie, tell us a little about your ancestor, uh, where they were from, and the whole backstory of this thing. Well, sure. Um, It it was funny because originally I was raised being told that we were related to Joseph Greer, the hero of King's Mountain in the Revolutionary War. Ah. And when I got serious about my family history, I realized I couldn't find anything that said that was the least bit true. So I was able to easily walk the family history back to the early 1800s, and there I met Odie Prosser Greer, who apparently was just hatched in the middle of Tennessee in 1801, (laughs) and no one knew who his parents were. Isn't that, you know, you just nailed it. That's how it feels sometimes. Somebody is just hatched. They don't come from anybody. Exactly. And and you can never connect them. Well said. (laughs) So I spent years off and on plowing through census records page by page. I read through all of the available newspaper records, trying to find anything I could. Never found anything. No death notices, no marriage, nothing. I was able to find his marriage license, so I knew he got married. I knew who his children were. Everything was clear from him down, but there was no idea whatsoever who his family was or where they came from. And nobody, I've run into numerous other people from other branches, from his other children, and they didn't know anything either. Hmm. So there's no family Bible anywhere, no family lore that might tie him back? Nothing at all. He was a complete mystery. And so how many years have you been looking for him? What's his name, Ossie? Odie. Odie. Yeah, he was he was named after a uh, a Revolutionary War soldier named Odie Prosser. Okay. And that's all anybody could figure out because it's such an unusual name right. that that had to be true. Sure, of course. So I had spent easily 10 years off and on. I'd get kind of tired, and I'd put it down for a little while, and I thought, there's just got to be something. And I would go back and just start all over again. But I never found anything in the records that would tell me anything. I found his marriage bond, and I saw who it was signed by. It was signed by a man named Moses Greer, but without any context, I had no idea who that was, really. But it's somebody to research. It was somebody to research. I finally determined that Moses Greer was born in Virginia and had moved to Tennessee. So I said, well, maybe he's got some connection to the Virginia Greers, but there are a lot of them. Sure. And, and you know, the, the nice thing is, is in this age we live in now, so many new things are coming available all the time. We're getting more and more breakthroughs on problems like this. And so you went ahead with some of that new technology, DNA. 
I did, yes. I hated to do it in a way it seemed in some ways kind of selfish to spend the money on it. And then my daughter said that she was interested in it. So I gave her a test for her birthday. My husband said, just go ahead and test yours. You want to know. So I tested. <laughs> what a good out. man. So you wound up doing double the DNA test. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> hey, but you saved on a birthday gift, right? There you go. Okay, yes. <laughs> so the results came back, and I started looking through the matches and everything. I was trying not to be too excited or too hopeful. And I ran across this match to a married couple, John and Sarah Day Greer. Okay. And they were in Virginia. And I said, okay, that's, that's unusual that I would be matched to both of them if, the, if there wasn't a, a family match there. Right. And, and there were more than one match that came down from this couple? Yes. Um, my daughter's DNA test, which I did through uh, Family Tree DNA, and I did mine through Ancestry, hers came through with a match to that same couple, but from a different a different person right. who had run the DNA test. So I had two different matches that put us through to the same couple. Well, that's a nice hint right there. And that's really how DNA is best used is when you start to triangulate like you did. Two different yes. places, two different people, two different matches or more. I've had as many as five come down from a couple in the 1700s that really gave me the idea that, okay, I'm good with the line that I thought I had. Exactly. So I started researching his family and realized that one of his great-grandsons moved from Maryland to Tennessee, and all of his children were born here. And my relative's birth year fit right at the end of the line with his known children. Oh, wow. So I thought, well, that's interesting. And then I realized that I also had a DNA match from a man that, when I first heard it, his name was Conrad Harkrider, and I didn't know who that was. Right. Good German line. Yes. And then I, then I was looking at my family tree, and I realized that she married John Greer's great-grandson. Oh, Okay. And so I said, well, he, there's got to be a relation. Otherwise, there's no way for me to be related to her. Sure, of course. So I started researching even more and found out that this Odie Prosser that my Odie was named after served with Odie's grandfather in the Virginia militia during the Revolutionary War. Perfect. All the puzzle pieces coming together now. Yes, exactly. And then I, I even found that Odie Prosser inventoried the estate when another member of the family died. So it became pretty clear that he was a family friend as well as a comrade in arms. Right. And there's a long history in this family of naming people after other people. Right. So, yes, so especially in that era. Fond. Yes, and so they were just fond enough of him to name their son after him. Right. So finally, after over 10 years, I have figured out who Odie's parents are. <laughs> right. And, and, you know, this is the thing a lot of people who are just getting started in genealogy would question. It's like, well, you mean you don't have a record that shows specifically that he was the son? No. Sometimes you actually have to put together, you know, a, it's almost like a legal case, isn't it? You know, it's, it's, yes, it's exactly it's all the evidence that comes together to point to a certain picture from which there can really be no other conclusion. Exactly. And what really I thought was kind of funny, I was looking last night at some old documents that I had pulled together, and I remembered that a man named Moses Greer signed the marriage bond for Odie and his wife Martha. Right. And that must have been actually Odie's brother. Yeah, that sounds like it makes sense, doesn't it? Yeah, cause, and, and so when I was looking, I found an old document that I had written up where I was looking at clues to who Odie Greer's identity might have been, and I had started chasing down all the Greers in Tennessee, and one of the things that I had noted down was that this same Moses Greer had signed other Greer men's marriage bonds, and now that I've put all the other pieces together, I've realized he signed the marriage bond for all his brothers. Perfect. That's just another big clue right there. Yeah, so I'm very excited. <laughs> yeah, I, I think so. How's your daughter feel about this? Well, she's very excited, too. You know, she used to kind of tolerate me when I would tell <laughs> I would be all excited when I found out something new. But she's very excited by all of this and the, all the pieces that it took to put it together. She's realized the amount of work that goes into it now. Yeah, but it's fun. And at the end of the day, did you find out if your family was tied to the hero of King's Mountain? 
No relation whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> How much further back do you go now? Do you have it back into Virginia quite a ways? Um, I'm able to take it all the way back to 1688. Very nice. Which is when the first Greer came over from Scotland. Well, that's awesome, Jeannie. Congratulations on your success. Thanks for uh, sharing with us, and uh, we share your joy and excitement. Thanks for joining us. Well, thank you very much for asking. All right, and coming up next, Tom Perry, our preservation authority from TMCPlace.com, answers another listener question, this time about strange colors coming up in her videos and her photos. What's going on there? Tom will tell you next on Extreme Jeans, America's Family History Show. Hi, Genies, it's Fisher, and I've been telling you about MyHeritage.com's amazing new technology that searches your family tree day and night for you, finding matches even while you sleep in documents and other people's trees. Here's a find I never would have made without it. It's a newspaper story about a relative of mine, Paul Sagal, who I knew many years ago. It's from 1943, when Paul was serving in the Pacific. When he learned his father died, he wrote a poem to his brother that indicated he wouldn't be returning for the funeral. He wrote, There'll be no furlough for me. I'm in the Marines, you see, alive and well as I am. Memories I'll keep of my dad. Then the newspaper editor added, These are all the sentiments that will win this war. There are treasures like this one waiting for you now. Put MyHeritage.com's superb technology to work for you with a 20% discount. Just enter the one-word promo code ExtremeGenes. MyHeritage.com is the next big thing. While we all love diving into the deep end of our gene pool, don't forget about capturing the histories of those who are still with us. Go to StoryWorth.com to start your family's story today. Each week, StoryWorth.com will email a question to people whose stories you wish to preserve. Questions like, tell us about the day you got engaged, or what do you remember about your grandmother? All they have to do is reply with a story, either by email or by telephone. That story is then forwarded to the family and securely stored in a private online storybook. It doesn't get any simpler. You can enroll up to six storytellers for, get this, just $49 a year. You'll get a free one-month trial. And for a limited time, Extreme Jeans listeners get an additional 10% discount at StoryWorth.com slash Extreme Jeans. That's StoryWorth.com slash Extreme Jeans. Is your family story worth 13 cents a day? Sign up now at StoryWorth.com slash Extreme Jeans. Simple, secure, effective. Your story is worth telling. Did you know that Family Search Family Tree is available through a powerful new mobile app experience? That's right. Now you can view, edit, and even add information to ancestors in your family tree whenever and wherever you are. You no longer need to wait to get home or make a date with your computer to view or update your family tree. You can add details to your tree when visiting with family or when capturing details from a trip to the cemetery. You can share new family history discoveries from classrooms settings. You can even make the most of your time when waiting for doctor appointments or car repairs. Get started today by downloading the free Family Search Family Tree app to your Apple or Android device. Visit familysearch.org slash tree app to get the Family Tree app for free. Exploring and expanding your family tree has never been more convenient. Visit familysearch.org slash tree app to download the Family Search Family Tree mobile app today. Hey, back at you. It's Extreme Genes, America's family history show and ExtremeGenes.com. Fisher here, the radio root sleuth with my friend Tom Perry from TMCPlace.com. He is the preservation authority. Good to see you again, Tom. Good to be here. And, uh, of course, you can always ask Tom at TMCPlace.com. That's his email address. And we did get a question from Linda Satweiler in Wisconsin, and she's asking about blue. She says, I watch TV or I take photographs, and they're not old, but they come back blue. What does this mean? That means your color balance is off. That's it? Yes. It's as simple as that? So for television or for photographs? Your color balance is off. Okay. And how does she fix this? Okay. It's actually pretty simple. Like when we're shooting, like, for instance, a music video or any kind of thing like that, 
what you do is if, if you light stuff by tungsten light, which is what the sun is, okay, the sun actually has a blue hue to it. It actually changes color during the day. In the morning, it's kind of more yellow. In the evening, it goes into red. That's right. So at noon, when it's at its brightest, it kind of has a blue hue. So if you're shooting something indoors under incandescent lights, they give off a total different color. So almost all cameras have a color balance. Nowadays, people ignore it because the automatic color balance is really, really good. Right, and we wouldn't know what we're doing anyway with that. Exactly. If you really want to get really true colors, what you want to do is you want to get a white piece of paper or a white card. Just make sure it's pure white. doesn't you know, matter. Even if it's got a few lines on it, that's sure. fine. But something white, aim your camera at it, and put your white balance on manual instead of automatic. Now, is that a button? Yeah. Yeah, okay. there's usually a little menu. On the new cameras, they have the LCD backs. You scroll through the menu, and there'll be white balance. And 99.9 of the people just leave it on automatic. They have no idea what it means. Nobody reads the manuals. But it can help you a lot in getting your colors. Even if things aren't blue, if things just aren't as crisp and bright, and you're thinking, why aren't these as good as I want them to be? Is there something wrong with my camera? Well, it's because everything's on automatic nowadays. Right. So put your camera on manual on your white balance. Aim your camera so it fills up the entire frame of just a white card. It could be a white sheet of paper, anything that's just, you know, pure white, and then push the button. So what's this doing? This is telling your camera, your camcorder, this is what white really looks like. Right. So now that the camera knows what white is, when you're shooting, it knows, okay, this is red, this is blue, this is green, this is whatever, because I know what white is. So white is the base color. Exactly. Because as we've talked about before, White is, like in this kind of world, white is an additive colors. All colors together equal white. Okay? Really? Yeah, all the colors, if you mix all the colors together, they'll uh, equal white. Like if you have a, a television, one of the older televisions has little dots. In fact, some of the new high-def ones, you can even see it. If you look really, really close at your screen, just get right up there, and there's something white on the screen, you'll see the red, the green, and the blue. Yes, you're right. All on the same time. So the red, the green, and the blue added together create white. So that's why it's called additive colors. Whereas if you look at a magazine, it's just the opposite. They start off with a white piece of paper, and then they add cyan, magenta, yellow, and black to make all the different colors. Huh. So that's how um, additive color works. So white is everything. So if you have your white right, everything else will be perfect. So now that you've set up your camera for incandescent lighting, which is what most people have in their home, then you take it outside and start shooting everything's going to look blue because all the blue from the sun and stuff is going to tell your camera, hey, this is what you told me white is, so this is what white is now outside, where white outside now is really blue. So you have to do your, your white page outside, basically? Right. Anytime you change lighting, if you go from fluorescent, incandescent, LED, different shades of LED outside, you need to do that with everything. So when you go outside, you'll need to re-white balance. That's why a lot of times when you're watching a news program, like 60 Minutes or 2020, you can see things like this, and after the break, I'll go in and tell you some different things to kind of watch for to help make sure you get those true colors you need. Exactly. All right, good stuff. We'll be back in three minutes on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show. Looking for an easy way to show off your family history and share it with your family? Family Chart Masters offers beautiful custom pedigree art pieces and inexpensive family reunion draft charts in any design or size that fits your needs. With a free consultation at FamilyChartMasters.com, you can get started creating a new family masterpiece. Family Chart Masters has over 11 years of experience in creating and printing family charts. They can print any style of genealogy chart from any genealogy file and can create exactly what you're looking for. You'll work with a specialized and talented a consultant whose goal is to make you happy. Decorative charts make fantastic gifts for all occasions. And with Family Chart Master's option of ordering duplicate charts at half price along with your original purchase at full price, you can afford to give a family heirloom to each member of your family. Contact Family Chart Masters today at FamilyChartMasters.com for your free consultation. Family Chart Masters will give the greatest care to your family history. 
When was the last time you heard your grandmother's voice or saw your family enjoying life back in the 1950s or 60s? If the reason is you haven't known what to do with your old recordings, videos, and films, here's your answer. The Multimedia Center in Salt Lake City. We brought in a video project to the Multimedia Center, and overnight, they duplicated it to DVD so we could meet our deadline. The Multimedia Center, 2870 East, 3300 South, Salt Lake City. Open Monday through Friday, 10 to 6. Call 801-483-1717 or go to Transfer Duplication. Can't figure out how to get your favorite Windows genealogy software running on your MacBook? Look no further than Crossover. Crossover by Codeweavers at www.codeweavers.com allows you to run your Windows software on your Mac without the need to buy a copy of Windows. Crossover is easy to install and simple to use. Crossover supports many popular genealogy packages like Roots Magic, Legacy Family Tree, Personal Ancestral File, Family Tree Builder, and more. Crossover also lets you run other popular productivity apps, like Microsoft Office and a wide range of games. So if you're looking for an easy, affordable solution to your Windows compatibility needs, visit www.codeweavers.com today to download your free trial of Crossover. And don't forget to use the deal code FAMILY for an additional 40% off when you purchase Crossover. Scientific studies have proven that youth who know even a little bit about their family history perform better academically and have a greater sense of personal confidence and stability. Genealogy is its own incredible superpower that arms our children with super strength. But how do you get your child or grandchild interested in studying their family history? That kind of stuff is just for grandmas, right? Not anymore. Zap the grandma gap.com leaps the generation gap in a single bound. Author Janet Havorka provides you with useful and timely advice on helping the young people in your life become engaged in their own family history. Janet has an entire collection of books to inspire the young and the young at heart in fun, interactive ways. She also offers creative tips and advice on her blog and in her free weekly newsletter. Stop by ZapTheGrandmaGap.com today to sign up for Janet's free email newsletter with 52 weeks of easy tips, free downloads, and order your set of resource books and workbooks. And we are back. Final segment, Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show. It is Fisher here, your radio root sleuth with Tom Perry from TMCPlace.com. He is our preservation authority. We've been talking about one of our listeners sending us an email saying, hey, my video, my pictures, everything's looking blue. What causes that? And we were just talking about it's a problem with your white balance. And Tom has explained exactly how that is done. Now, you mentioned, Tom, that if you watched a show like 60 Minutes or, or 2020, if you saw, say, a window behind it, it might appear blue. Why would that be? Okay, because what they do in the studio, they usually light a studio to what they call 5600K, which is a Kelvin number, which really doesn't mean a whole lot. It's just telling the cameras, hey, this is optimal lighting. They don't have bad shadows. The talent's going to look the best they can. And then they tell the cameras, this is what white is. So then when they pan to a window or there's a window over uh, an interview, it's going to look blue because the light coming in through the window is a different color than what they just, the tungsten that they just oh, set it to. because you mentioned that you can set the white inside and it's different from outside, but if you're looking at outside light coming inside, you got a problem. Exactly. So then the windows look blue, and people see this all the time. Even sometimes some live news shows, they can kind of see the window outside. But then if you look at a real good produced program that has a lot of windows behind it, like Good Morning America or something like that, what they do is they put a red gel over all the windows and so now the light coming through this blue hits the red and turns white. So to Really? Speak. So then it looks perfectly fine. You see, it would look different in the studio, you're saying, if you were part of an audience. Oh, right, right. If you're sitting there, you're going to see that, you know, there's red gels over the window. And the same thing is in the old days when they had the CRT televisions, the big tubes in them. If you were watching in the old days um, a news program and they had a television there that you could see, they would have a red gel over that too to bring out the true colors because they had white balance to what the colors in the studio were. So even the television itself would look kind of funky, so they'd put a red gel over it. Isn't that interesting? We can't see these colors in our day-to-day -day lives, but boy, it sure shows up in our cameras and those things we're trying to preserve of our kids and our grandkids. Oh, absolutely, because lighting is so important. I think that's one of the Second after audio is one of the things that's missed up the most 
So I'm assuming our listener, what she had done is accidentally turned her camera on manual and didn't realize it. And so wherever it was white balanced last is what it always thinks white is, which could have been a fluorescent light, which are green. It could have right. been a halogen light, which are usually kind of white to yellow. It could be daylight, which is usually blue. And so however that was set, it's always like that now. So what she can do is use that to her advantage and white balance every time she changes her setting or just say, I don't want to deal with it, put it back to automatic, which is generally pretty good. Now, on the other hand, if we were shooting a music video or we wanted to have something look like it was shot at night, but yet we actually shot the band during the day, we would do just the opposite. We would color balance to white what it's supposed to be. But then after we had white balance, we'd put blue gels over the windows, we'd put blue gels over the lights, we'd put blue gels over everything. So now the camera thinks blue is white. So everything <laughs> has this blue look to it, we'd light it just the right way, and you would swear that it was a nighttime shot, and it was shot at you know noon. Is that how a lot of movies are done? Exactly, that's how they are. In fact, that's one thing kind of off track that really drives me crazy is I see these outside scenes where the light is just beautiful. You know, there's no shadows, there's no everything you can see for miles, and the light's just exactly normal. But they want that. What they do is they send up these uh, blimps, so to speak. They have giant lights in them, so they just cast this whole field, has this beautiful light. And anybody that's been out, even on a full moon night, knows it's not going to cover everything like that. And it drives me nuts, but it makes a movie look good. <laughs> but that's important. Work on your audio, work on your lighting, and that'll help you a lot. All right. Great advice. It's always good to have you on, Tom. Good to be here again. Hey, that wraps up the show for this week. Thanks once again to Bill Harton from Pazilla for telling us about his incredible software for tracking down your ancestors' descendants. And to Jean Nicholson of Tennessee, who found her ancestors from way back using triangulation and DNA. If you didn't catch it, you'll want to hear the podcast. Talk to you again next week. And remember, as far as everyone knows, we're a nice, normal family. Family.